Hi, good morning, everybody, and thank you for joining us this morning. I hope um, in the next hour you'll hear something that will be a little bit um, sort of connecting with you or inspiring or just reassuring. And uh, at the end, we'll be able to scoop up as many questions as possible. But it may be that during the course of the next hour, I answer some questions. And uh, I've got to start with sort of a thank you for all the um, autism knowledge, really, that the women and girls that I've had the privilege of um, working with, of meeting, of being friends with, um, have inspired me with. And um, these four women that I've got here on my screen, Nicola and Alice and Lexi and Ellie, uh, sprung immediately to mind when I was asked to do this presentation, which is why I sort of put them in. Um, a couple of them are their own names, a couple of pseudo names, because um, that's how they wanted it to be. Um, but what I hope is that by them journeying with us, we'll have an insight as to that whole sort of spectrum as of, of autism that applies to women and girls as well as to men and boys. And this kind of real um, sort of media coverage at the moment of this sort of um, sometimes missed, uh, sometimes misunderstood presentations of um, autism, which is why I've sort of decided to really touch on some of those key points around that so that a b c d sort of where autism presents and how in some cases as uh, females we're very good at sometimes um putting on the act and so we'll cover um how acting or through um autism can be quite an effective way of masking of uh, coping and trying to fit in how sort of behavior sort of um, manifests itself and can really influence, you know, those um, desires for friendship, those kind of, you know, besties really. Sometimes um, we want to be besties and sometimes we need some time alone. And then also thinking about that C, the sort of communication and how there's some differences in interpreting, understanding and communicating. And then how we can sort of celebrate, actually, all of those and um, what, you know, many uh, times we hear autism, ADHD, neurodiversity are sometimes described as superpowers. And I know sometimes as a parent or and certainly myself, um, you know, as a grandma as well, sometimes you don't feel that um, there's necessarily a superpower revealing itself at that very moment in time. But what we will do is really look at some of those values, some of those strengths that um, we'll have that we can tap into and use for our advantage. And I think um, a good place to start is this whole idea of sort of conceptions and misconceptions. And I think this is why we're getting a lot of um, media coverage around women and autism and, and misdiagnosed or not diagnosed or late diagnosis. And of course, the same does apply um, to our male society um, and community, autistic community. But I think um, what's happened is there's been kind of almost an explosion of realization. And I think, you know, Emily um, in this tweet here really kind of um, explains that by saying that actually, you know, she was afraid not to be given that diagnosis of autism. And I think sometimes what happens is we've we've spent a lot of time trying to sort of mask things, trying to fit in, but not actually feeling as if you did. And so sometimes for some people, that diagnosis can come as a relief. And one of our misconceptions is that we're afraid to pursue it because we think, you know, it might cause more anxiety or manifest more difficulties for um, our daughters and our granddaughters and, and the women and girls that we're working with perhaps in school or college um, or even nursery. So to kind of just touch base with that presentation of autism and to get a better, deeper understanding of how that might reveal itself in different women, I'm going to just um, put our toe in the water of some of the um, life experiences 
that the four women that I mentioned at the start have um, have had and how that can help us to have a better insight. So if we think about all the different presentations of autism, we think about our sensory system, our social and communication um, abilities, our understanding what's going on in other people's minds, our ways and means of social interaction, our ways of understanding and, and organizing ourselves and sort of sorting ourselves out, how we sort of see detail and decode that and how we work towards um, sort of compensating sometimes with repetition and structure and um, persistence and how sometimes we may be perceived as quite impulsive. So thinking about all of those presentations, which are very applicable to all of our autistic community, irrespective of gender or preferred um, presentation and explanation of ourselves. So I think um, it's important to think that it's not a different diagnostic profile. It's just sometimes a different presentation. So I think Nicola, um, we'll start with Nicola. And when I met her, she always described herself as a bit of a soup mix of mental health diagnosis. She got a history of um, low self-esteem and anxiety. And whilst attending the um, NAS early bird program that I was running at the time, she identified both herself as having um, experienced many of the aspects of autism and of course her son as well. And she felt that she'd never fit in. She said that she didn't get when people were joking or not and that her relationships had in the past been difficult um, because she was often confused by intent and intentional. And she needed to, you know, do things differently. She said she needed to bathe in the dark in order to cope with the feeling of water on her skin. And she worried in meetings that she came across rude. And particularly if they, they were meetings about, around her children, you know, she, she felt she was the mamasaurus epitomized. And I think we can all be mamasauruses sometimes and we become very protective. But what we don't want to do is come across as brusque or blunt or rude, which is something she worried about. And in order to compensate for that, she would then sort of back out and, and not be able to attend those meetings at the very last minute. So those fears and anxieties were really impacting and getting in the way. And Alice was a bit similar in some ways in that um, she received a diagnosis in high school. And by then she'd sort of established herself as the class daredevil um, and until things went too far and she found herself being expelled. So how do you articulate? Well, things. the thing is, you know, my peers are quite confusing. I don't understand them. You know, perhaps when they were younger, they used to be fun. And, you know, now they're into makeup and boys and it's boring. But, you know, I like that I think I'm still lots of fun and, and I make them laugh. So for Alice, understanding that social peer group behavior can bring huge challenges and is often described as obscure and confusing. And it certainly was for Alice. So the areas of challenge and often of ability are very apparent, but sometimes masked. And certainly in Lexi's profile, they were very apparent in some ways. So she was reading uh, far in advance of her years. She, as a mum says, seems to have an articulate answer, an argument for everything. She would sort of feel that, you know, a mum would feel she was sort of outwitting her, as it were, and she couldn't sort of keep one step ahead. And, you know, she's very, Lexi's very intolerant of mistakes and can't see why, if she can, you know, kneel up on her chairs at home with no shoes on, that that's an issue um, that she, you know, she can't do that in school. I mean, personally, neither could I see why, but, you know, that's a whole other um, conversation, perhaps not for right now. But certainly Lexi got her diagnosis very recently. And her mum shares that many of her friends and family comment, well, I just don't see it. You know, they're, 
the and I think you know for that mum you know there's a loaded observation isn't it and for some parents and grandparents it can feel like a bit of a kick in the stomach and you know in my experience um you know a well-intentioned friend or family member makes those throwaway comments but you know this is often kind of the root of an issue here and it can be subtle and it's not always apparent and that's where you know we can end up in this dilemma and this field of those sort of misconceptions so you know the fact that Lexi and Nicola and Alice, to an extent, had all learned to play the social game, to mimic expectations and behaviours. But when this gets overwhelming and confusing, an alternative escape is often sought. And perhaps we, you know, retreat into oneself. We become the class daredevil or we're constantly fighting our corner and arguing our corner. Or we're trying to understand the social world and coping with sensory differences and trying to keep up with your peers sort of and our interests might be intense and our knowledge very um you know rich and and worthwhile and sort of all part of that autism spectrum and you know whilst this is applicable of course to our male and transgender non-binary old young high iq low iq individuals it is the perception and the ability of those um surrounding the individual to sort of listen and hear and understand and and when i say listen and hear and understand i mean like really know that person you know really kind of be with them walk alongside them hear their values hear their worries hear their cries hear their giggles you know be part of that person and how they experience the world and how they experience the environment so that hopefully we can move beyond this whole feeling of having to mask having to pretend that you know we can be honest we can say actually you know i feel really awkward here i don't kind of get what's going on and share that because that um you know that hiding that covering over is something that you know is really being um talked about and and understood better and you know i'll touch on christine mcginnis and and her um openness and encouragement that she's given to um the female autistic community and i think um you know the fact that we are talking about this more is in itself going to be more revealing and i certainly um you know learned it from ellie um who you know she taught me so much she was a little girl who had a diagnosis at two because her presentation is accompanied with many of the learning difficulties and the the more severe um connections with autism that people sometimes have you know her behaviors created confusion and in particular her sensory processing was profoundly difficult and ellie would strip off at every opportunity she wouldn't hold um, a drawing pen herself but she guided her father's hand to create the most basic picture of a house but would visibly be really upset and her behaviors would be off the scale if he tried to move his hand away before he'd drawn um, all four windows for her. Fascinating and um, so, you know, revealing and, and creative and um, actually, you know, something that stuck, you know, I witnessed this happening when I was in a home visit and it's just stuck with me forever because it was just incredible to see this child who came across as not communicating, not able to um, express her needs, not connecting so easily. And yet here she was, you know, making sure that her daddy did the drawing exactly as she wanted. So as we can see, whilst today we are examining that female presentation, we must be really mindful as well of that spectrum of presentation which may well be influenced by not simply an IQ, but also our environmental experiences. 
So let's have a look at some of these sort of closer elements. So if we think about our social flexibility, you know, often associated with coping with change, three-year-old Emily is described as already ruling the roost. She insists on her parents sit on specific seats in the lounge and she'll play the same tea party game over and over again. So here we witness Emily creating routines and a sense of calm, her way of sort of making sense of the world as it were. And you know, she's, she's actually creating some predictability there, which can offer lots of us, you know, lots of members of our autistic community, lots of members of our society, a real sense of calm, sometimes being in control, sometimes predicting what is going to happen is the best way of maintaining calm. It's not about being bossy or you know trying to be kind of ruling the roost just for the sake of it. It's that interpersonal um, calm that we're trying to achieve. And then if we think about theory of mind, you know, I worked many years ago now with a grandma who was supporting her daughter with her autistic grandson and uh, I'm smiling at the memory of this. The grandma told me she'd only realized her daughter was autistic when her grandson got his diagnosis. And she said that, um, ironically enough, it was her vulnerability that had got her, her daughter pregnant in the first place. And she really has no concept that she was being taken advantage of. And this is a particular sensitive area and one that we often shy away from. And, the reality is that research demonstrates that for many autistic people, the skills in detecting intent can be severely compromised. And so this can lead to vulnerability and therefore does highlight that actually we've got or, you know, people supporting and um, family members, we've got a real responsibility here in equipping our autistic girls in particular with the skills to keep safe. You know, we want our girls to fly free, but as Sparrow Rose Jones' um, it, it book says, um, you know, it, it's hard to be open and honest and there needs to be emphasis on the value of talking freely and openly about sex and sexualization and what that means. And as with many topics for autistic young people, the very worst thing we can do is make assumptions about pre-gathered information or knowledge. And, you know, I often see that when people are kind of putting together what they think perhaps is a social story and they kind of stop before they've put the next bit, the most important bit in the social element of what's going to happen. So it becomes more of a diary really. And that happens because often neurotypical people have got flexibility of thought. And so they automatically understand that if, for example, you're going to go to the doctor for an appointment, that that involves some kind of emotional and social experience. And because we just know what that might or may be, what that experience may be, then we tend to kind of not explain that bit, but actually for most and, and probably all of our autistic community, that's the bit they need to know. That's the bit that gets missed off or gets misinterpreted or feels confusing. So, you know, just a bit of a kind of push there for remembering to add that most important bit of information in. So, if we think about central coherence theory during um, cooking a Christmas cake in school, um, that sort of, you know, I remember a, a student wrapping the tin in the hole, um, you know, saying wrap, wrap brown paper around the outside of the tin. And this particular student wrapped it like a parcel. And then, you know, an executive functioning memory, sort of, you know, living alone at university, um, and handing dates coming um, close, you know, would cause real anxiety. And so, you know, for some students, that concept of planning ahead and doing sort of X number of works, of words, sorry, for an assignment, like each day or, uh, you know, each week, 
that kind of didn't come into place so they have that last minute panic and be those sitting up in the library all night so you know that sort of planning ahead can be really challenging and then of course not surprisingly that we've got that anxiety and you know we tend to then maybe try and hide behind and I know Christine McGuinness said that you know avoidance was one of her techniques to not have to deal with some of those social occasions and so I think you know hopefully that's just given us all a real sort of touch base reminder and feel for how these um, presentations and uh, diagnostic pointers in our um, female autistic community can really um, manifest and I think you know classically in our pre sort of conceived perceptions we kind of delude our identification of autistic girls and I know you know I've had it said to me before that only autistic women um, can or should enlighten the world about their um, experiences and I kind of to an extent I get um, what that means and obviously you know those experiences are invaluable but I, I also think that um, you know autistic women need um, neurotypical women as part of their lives as well and you know we need autistic women in our lives because that's the only way that you know we can all sort of empower each other and it's the only way that we can all understand each other and value and allow um, everyone to be sort of you know thine own uh, true self and sort of you know true to thine own self and I think um, you know this little picture here this preschool picture of a, a little girl there playing with dollies is perhaps something that we then sort of think oh well you know for lots of children, boys as well, you know, that's a very typical picture. But for this um, particular little girl, uh, you know, the uh, idea of allowing another child in the nursery to touch, carry or play with those dollies would be something that would take observation, that would be something that would take noticing. Because of course, we have these preconceived ideas and we dismiss things very quickly as typical. Oh, well, you know, she's carrying the dollies round. That's very typical. Typical of her where she's at in her schemas of development, in terms of transportation and all those kinds of things, but also typically in terms of play. So what I'm saying is let's stop with the typical and let's start being and walking with and understanding that actually it's okay to stand out sometimes and um, Jess Wilson whose daughter was diagnosed in 2006 she has a blog a diary of a mom and she reminds us to sort of strip away these assumptions and enableism and deeply what she describes as deeply ingrained neurotypical bias and we should be about questioning a need to fit in and empower the standout because it's there that we find ourselves at our own emotional and social junctions and I think our daughters may well stand out from their crowd at times and feel happy with that but I think we've heard all too many times sort of the anxiety that can sort of bubble from you know never quite fitting in never feeling that and taking that perspective interpersonally. So from autism to besties is about appreciating those social skills and the energy and the effort that is spent attempting to enjoy the company of a bestie, an ally, the person who's got your back. We all need those people in our lives. And I know I recall when um, watching that Christine and Paddy McGuinness um, story our family and autism that Christine at times you know she categorically avoided socializing with peers and you know and close and valued friends and I think you know just as many neurotypical people might but what also particularly struck me was the difference in sort of what influenced her decision to stay at home you know a neuro um, typical female may be more shaped by 
sort of the social shared interests and the values. But for our autistic girls, you know, before they even get there, their choice may be shaped by kind of the hard work of keeping open and sort of decoding what's going on and trying to understand the silent language of a glance or a look or a raised eyebrow that does dominate much of our intuitive, socially based, and dare I even say it, put myself out there, you know, typically female communication. You know, how many times do we um, sometimes glare at our partner instead of picking up on the glare and acting it goes, what are you glaring at? So, um, you know, I might have put my head on the neck, on my neck on the line there, but I can share an experience, uh, I'm sure. So, you know, no wonder that um, anxiety is high on the list of experiences. And I think, you know, one of the skills that many um, girls, autistic girls have is mimicry and often, you know, learning those social cues from characters in movies, from soaps, modeling um, themselves on a female that they admire, that kind of almost social and physical echolalia, that ability. And it is an ability to remember and recite, you know, great chunks of what has been heard. And, you know, I, I think those are skills and skills to be embraced. And I recall um, a family I worked with a grandma and a mum who got a diagnosis while attending um, an early intervention programme. And she told me, again, um, a home visit, that um, she got by at school by sitting quietly at the back and never asking any questions. And she had tried to adopt the same approach in the group. But during table discussion, the other parents were so interested in her and wanted to know more about her experience. And she absolutely loved their interest and felt truly valued. And I think, you know, just as an aside to this, the very same mum had tried to guide me to her home when um, I rang uh, to say I was lost. And uh, she, she told me, um, could I see the red car outside a house? And when I eventually got to her house and explained why I couldn't see the red car outside a house, she said to me, oh, she said, I'm telling the truth, but she said she just finds that uh, it's so really complicated to understand. She, she gets, she says, I believe you. I know you're telling the truth, but she said it doesn't make any sense to me. And I kind of, I do cite sort of constantly how much I learn and I'm privileged to meet people. And, uh, you know, she's certainly a, a great teacher for me. But I think, you know, the fact that she took that sort of sit back and, and be quiet approach, again, just really reflects the differences because, you know, I, I know women whose family members would say, oh, you know, the Bolshe, they're the first one there sort of thing. So again, it's about, I think, empowering our women and girls to stand out and for us not to be afraid of explaining why our experience is different. How can an autistic girl, woman, lady, little girl, teenager, adolescent, how can they know that their experience is different to ours if we don't explain why and how that is the case? Because if they're always left just knowing it's different, but not knowing about the elements of difference, then we are leaving them feeling at sea. So I think, you know, reflecting on these differences and sort of decoding that social world leads us to inevitably um, thinking about communication. And, you know, I've met articular and academic communicators. And as I've already said, you know, pre-verbal, less able communicators and parents who wish that their child spoke more and parents who wish their child or their daughter, the teenager, didn't talk quite so much. So, you know, then I came across an interesting reflection in the book. And I think um, I'm not, I don't always advocate particular books because I think people take from books what they want to and everybody reads differently. You know, I'm actually a really slow reader. I actually find it really difficult to read. 
So, um, you know, I kind of like an audio book if I can get my hands on one. But I actually did, um, you know, read this book and I, and I like this series. So this is the what every autistic girl wishes her parents knew. And it's by um, Emily Page Balu, uh, 2017. And she um, talks in the book about a lady called Jane Strauss, who is herself autistic and has four autistic daughters. So definitely a wealth of knowledge and richness to share. And I loved that, you know, these, these um, stories help to bring our understanding and our presentation um, thoughts and diagnostic profiles to life and to have real meaning. And she said that um, she, she kind of believes that um, I wish blocks belief. And I, and I like that. I like that concept. I think it does. I think, you know, I wish they would talk more. I wish they would talk less. I wish they would behave differently. I wish they would do this or I wish they would do that. And she said that belief is the daughter you have. You know, belief is in that person. Belief is in their own individualness. And the girl in your class has all she needs to be the person she's supposed to be. The daughter in your family has, has all she needs to be the person she's supposed to be. And what we need to do is put our energy into our self-belief that we can be there, we can support and we can understand. We can understand our daughters, we can understand ourselves. And that's something I think that um, gets squashed and squeezed out when we feel a bit like an island floating aimlessly um, or an object floating aimlessly um, in the sea alone. And we know that, you know, the sunset um, is the sunset is there beyond and sometimes feeling beyond our reach. And I think that's when we have those experiences of low self-esteem. And certainly that's something that's frequently uh, mentioned by our autistic um, girls and their families that often they feel you know confused by being told that perhaps they're a good girl but then faced with a whole host of interventions and strategies and appointments and you know this can often be perceived to be attempting to change who they are and I think Jane Strauss is emphasis on kind of the value of encouraging our autistic girls to pursue an interest that they enjoy and to importantly to empower them to be themselves to empower them with the knowledge of who they are and that that is okay and that it's not okay for us to spend you know time energy and, and therapies on trying to change but we should be spending time energy and therapies on helping bring out the best just like we do with all children that we work with you know we provide all the rich experiences from kindergarten to college so you know we've got to continue doing that and um, for our autistic girls and supporting them in making a query supporting them in finding understanding supporting them in finding meaning to what's going on you know get them to ask not pretend use role play to practice those scenarios to play out scenarios so that they are equipped with the responses they've got those um experiences on board in a in a more real way for them so you know to use their often amazingly detailed and accurate observation skills to notice kindness and to choose to be a person of kindness is really important and we can you know we've got the skills to do that ourselves we can do that with our daughters and you know support them in their um real understanding so my next little picture here is just um always again makes me smile because it was a, a an autistic child who said 
gee, you can buy happy in a box. And I know um, certainly when I was presenting at one of the Witherslack conferences a couple of years ago, I um, that brought a number of smiles to the audience. But I think, you know, is that being processed as an emotion in a box? So, you know, what do we see there other than a well-loved dessert, perhaps? But as I say, you know, presentations can be subtle so and easily overlooked. This little child might just think, well, you know, repeated sort of that um, if he hadn't shared that, then the parents, the family members wouldn't have known that that was his perception. So that's why I'm sort of highlighting that at this point that, you know, that um, hidden presentation, that repeated making of a cup of tea in the home corner may only um, alert educators, you know, when the child refuses to play with a different cup or get upset if another one, you know, another child tries to get involved in that game. And then if the child is simply mirroring what they've observed another child do or say, is there a clue in the voice, in the intonation? Are the behaviours very exact? Or is this the sort of articulate verbal little girl locked dreamily in her unicorn world, seeming to struggle between fantasy and reality? You know, trying every day to wear a princess outfit to school, or the young woman noticing her peers no longer um, hold their interests. So, you know, those presentations can be very subtle and can be hidden. And it might be that we have to be more skillful in what we are looking out for and what it is that we are trying to um, observe as well. So perhaps now, when we notice these little sort of subtle differences, we look for the rest that may be just resting, maybe hidden in this slide here, you know, resting behind each of those little sort of picture clues that are there on that slide. And that, you know, it might be sort of a survival blanket that's being pulled over. And then we might just notice them and we might highlight them and support them, perhaps with some structure, with some logical reassurance. And this may well take the shape of sort of tangible visual reminders. It may be that we need to offer smaller learning groups rather than isolated learning. It may be we need to talk more closely alongside the child, sort of perhaps refusing to go into class because actually the warmly intended welcome is the sensory overloading and the girls on the carpet touching your hair is not inclusive, but intolerable. So education is key and we must stop shying away from sharing our daughter's stories. We've got to encourage our teachers to notice that the other children question why a child has gone out to learn with Mrs. M. An autistic mum told me that she vomited, every, her daughter um, vomited every Tuesday with fear of PE. And uh, as time went on, this got worse and worse until she was actually diagnosed with bulimia. And as a young child, a teenage girl shared with me that she had refused to eat real food associated. Um, sorry, it was the food and the smell association, not um, eating real food. So she found that... Um, she couldn't deal with play food because it associated the real taste and the real smell for her. And so that put her off completely. And, you know, so the doctor was suspecting anorexia, but actually if, um, you know, querying if anything untoward was going on with the family and, you know, it, it turned out to be a, a, a really kind of big issue in the family. And actually what was going on was some very subtle underlying sensory association behaviors where seeing play food, feeling play food, or you know, just triggered 
that real sensory thing. So, for example, a little, you know, play fish or a play sausage for this child was just for all the overwhelming tastes and smells. And so the child was then unable to eat. So these are the things that I'm sort of saying, you know, we've got to really start um, noticing the subtle presentations and not jumping. And I think this is what happens. We often jump to our neurotypical conclusions before we've really explored things greatly. And I know, you know, sometimes throwaway comments can cause that same sort of um, difficulty. So just being more open and more aware, I guess, is what I'm trying to sort of get over here. But sometimes those presentations can be very subtle, can be so hidden that we quickly jump to a neurotypical conclusion and we then are in danger of locking out all of that subtleness that we need to be embracing and addressing and openly talking about. Because it's only then that we get to this point of celebrating our differences and supporting our girls in self-pride, in self-belief, and, you know, make up books full of more than lipstick and shadows, full of highlighters and liners of qualities. They have the other girls, they, ha they get that, but other girls, perhaps, you know, our girls perhaps don't. So, you know, we need to be thinking about creativity, about how we can sort of, thinking in broader thinking skills and that ability to notice small changes and you know to pick up on other people's joys as well as their pains to role play and model and practice you know where there is a desire to kind of better understand to fit in to notice that you know everyone's feet tells a story we all step into unfamiliar, scary territory sometimes, and we all need different treatments. We might need our feet embalming sometimes in a nice warm wrap. We might need a foot massage. We might just need, um, you know, bare feet and flip flops and a kind of, or a cozy pair of socks. But what I'm trying to say here is just using feet as a bit of an analogy for the fact that actually, we are all different. We are all individual. All of our daughters, all of our granddaughters, all of the girls in our classes, in our schools, in our colleges have that uniqueness. And not all girls will be masking autism. Not all girls will be articulate in communication and, and pretense, but some will. And, and that's what we need to be looking out for all of those um, presentations and you know we need to remember and share and discuss the energy and the effort to make friends and to have that recovery time we need to be you know fighting um, autism you know is fighting our child and so we need to be not fighting autism we need to be embracing that to support our daughters in being their very best selves. So rather than acting their autism, they are, they are their autism. They are, that is who we are, you know, an autistic individual who has all of those profiles and presentations and who does find that social environment challenging and hard work and will need recovery time even when they've spent time with their very best friends and so understanding those you know communication may be masking it may be hiding what's truly inside we want to encourage that open honest and perhaps less directive that sort of maybe we need to um, operate a, a dear diary sort of model if our child is you know, pre-verbal, maybe we need to observe their communication. You know, a gorgeous little girl I met was very clear in her communication, her desire to tidy away bricks rather than play with them. And, you know, we need to try to be a skillful listener, even when no words are used. 
excuse me. So celebration needs to be internalized. Many of us struggle to celebrate. Many of us internally perhaps are haunted by imposter syndrome and self-doubt and fear of being perceived as boastful. So, you know, we may have a journey to walk together with our autistic girls. I think we do. We do have a journey to walk together. And, you know, we we can do that by hooking into what we know our girls will be receptive to, you know, perhaps creating a high five sticky note when, um, you, you know, we need to give a reminder about something, but telling or saying can be too much. You know, I, I love that you, you know, have those abilities to do things differently. I love that you have a great way of using the same sort of sentence starter. So I think, you know, what I'm trying to suggest is that we really use some of those sort of strategies and ideas that we perhaps classically use for um, creating structure and routine and predictability, but that we use those for giving that, um, you know, real sort of sense of on board and alongside our daughters. And, you know, we love that our girls have got that sense of justice, that creativity, that sort of complex visualization, the observation skills that they have, the repetition, the movement, you know, with dance, with role play, modeling, those echolalic skills, you know, the list goes on and on. The passion and compassion that our girls have means that they are going places and we just have to support them and let them be part of that um, going places. So I hope that, um, you know, I've said something or that something has touched your heart and mind during today's webinar and I will hopefully um, be able to answer some questions for you now that perhaps have come about whilst you were listening. Hi Anne Marie, thanks ever so much for that. It was it was fantastic. We have had so many questions that have come okay. in for you. Um, so we'll try and do now 10, 15 minutes of a Q&A session for everybody. Um, yeah. but unfortunately, I don't think we're going to get through all of the questions that we've received today. But thank you, everybody, for, for sending them in. Um, so to begin with, um, any tips on managing meltdowns? This eight year old is very acad academic, but still having like meltdowns after school where they'll lay down on the pavement and really upset. And this all happens after school. Yeah. So I think sometimes when we see these, um, you know, occasions after school, it could be that something's building up in school during the day. And I think, you know, without exception, it's always worth talking to school and seeing if there are occasions. You know, I mentioned that word recovery. And I think that our girls, you know, need those recovery occasions throughout the day. So is there somewhere that she could maybe just have some downtime or, you know, it's we're always working a bit blind with our questions. But if this is a little girl that likes lots of activity and lots of movement, you know, is there occasions throughout the day where she can have that? Or if this is a little girl that likes to sit quietly and read or just to, you know, be in her own little world, you know, are there occasions through the day where she can have that as well? And I think it's always worth noticing if the behaviors are different at the weekend and looking at why, you know, what are you allowing to happen at the weekend that can't happen during the school day and seeing if that might help. But certainly not just managing the meltdown and, you know, kind of dealing with that with the reassurance and the calm and perhaps the hug or the leaving alone for the moment. And, you know, that's not good enough for us to just cope with those moments we've got to find out and try and address what's causing what's built bu what's building up to those moments and i know it's hard sometimes and it just seems to come out of nowhere but i think you know if we're seeing a pattern 
we're already getting some clues there as to where we need to be looking a little bit more intensely. Thanks, Anne-Marie. OK, so we'll move on to the next question now. Um, how can I actually explain autism to my daughter as she thinks it's something really bad? I think making sure that um, you've got um, to your, you know, fingers on your fingertips um, some really good role models of autistic women and girls. I would really um, recommend getting that book that I mentioned, um, uh, What Every Parent Needs to Know. Uh, there's some really fabulous profiles in there and I think um, really selling the uh, things that are listed at the end there, the compassion, you know, all of those um, sort of complex presentations but values that, um, you know, really spending some time before you actually start discuss discussing autism noting and noticing your daughter's particular um, strengths and abilities and you know turning those around sometimes that you know and I think some, we've fallen into the trap in the past of saying you know oh you spend so much time doing that whereas what we should be saying is it's fantastic that you are able to attend for so long rather than why can you spend so much time doing that but you can't do x or y so really selling that um, profile as a, a real positive and then talking very honestly and very openly and certainly um, on the National Autistic Society website there are some really good handouts around um, explaining autism to your child so definitely worth um, logging on to www.autism.org.uk um, and, and getting a look at those first. Thanks, Anne-Marie. Um, so we've had quite a lot of questions around this, and so I've just tried to um, simplify it really um, so we can try and cover everyone. Um, how can I get school or college to see that my daughter is masking everything? You know what? Just by way of consolation, this is one of the most common things that um, I think happens in our autistic community. And you know, I think there's a lot of talk around masking and women at the moment, but it's not something that is unique to our women. And I, I think hopefully as the world opens its eyes, then for goodness sake, surely our schools need to open their eyes as well. I think the only way you can really share that information is to be very explicit and to try and give them very real examples of why you know that and how you know that. And I, I think, you know, um, I, I think getting examples of when you have noticed that masking is definitely occurring, then, and presenting them actually with that very example. And um, I've got a, a kind of a, a thought in my head of a girl who she, um, was kind of going along with a, an activity in the playground and then when she went back into class the girls were kind of carrying on this pretend game and um, the uh, autistic girl actually just started to cry and uh, the teacher did take her to one side and, and said what's the matter and she said I, I don't, I don't know if we're playing or if we're not. And I think, you know, that was a revelation for that teacher. So if there are any kind of revelation moments that you've had that you can share with them, I, I think that can be really helpful. And it is difficult because it is so subtle that you almost forget. So I would be quickly making a note of when that happens because, you know, that little girl was just really confused by, is was it a game or was it reality? And I think, you know, the teacher saw that in that moment, but prior to that hadn't. So I'm sorry, I can't really give any very kind of, you know, categoric solution, but I think just noticing and sharing you noticing is the best we can do. Thanks, Anne-Marie. Okay, so we've got another question here. Um, 
how can I as a mum help my older daughter and husband cope with having to change their behaviours um, towards our younger um, daughter, sibling, who has ASD, ADHD and selective mutism? Oh, I hate that term. We won't go into that. <laughs> but yeah, um, what's selective about it, hey? But that's for a whole other occasion. Uh, so I think, again, um, information, information, information and knowledge. And I think it's not unusual for um, sort of siblings to really struggle with accepting and understanding. Because, of course, in a way, you know, they've grown up on a different place, at a different place with our children than we as parents perhaps have. And so, you know, they don't even necessarily see this child as being different, you know, or warranting a diagnosis or warranting a label because they just, in a way, perhaps see them for who they are. And, you know, siblings don't always get each other and they don't always understand each other. And we often have to do some support in embracing and appreciating the individual in families. And so I think, you know, making sure that they are equipped with information. And again, a bit like the answer to the previous question, I think, you know, um, sharing the noticing is really important. And, um, you know, hoping that, actually need your information as well. It's hard, isn't it, when people won't access information. I tend to find if people won't read a particular article or aren't interested enough to look at a book, that if you can sort of just, um, you know, share a YouTube clip or encourage people to, you know, watch a film and that sort of thing, Sometimes that kind of media information, rather than coming directly from you, can sort of just be a little bit of a bridge into opening up sort of communication and belief and mindset. So I hope that's helpful. It feels a bit kind of fluffy around the edges, but yeah, I think using media to share information can be better than trying to tell them yourselves. Thanks, Anne-Marie. Um, so I'll, I know we're short on time now, but I will try and just squeeze a couple more questions in, if that's OK, because we've had so many. Um, yeah, I'm just thinking, gonna... Claire, as well, just in response to the to the previous question, you know, send them this link, send them the podcast. Yeah, yeah, de definitely, definitely. Um, so this next question, I've tried to... Um, because we've had so many that are around this sort of subject, I've tried to group group them together again. And um, so, how can we best support an ASD girl socially and emotionally in a mainstream secondary school? So, I think again, it's making sure that um, we are embracing and supporting her in understanding who she is in being very open with her about the things that she may find confusing, that she may struggle with, and explaining why that might be the case. And then sort of making sure that we've done lots of preparation, lots of um, role play, giving her those tools, those skills, and you know, having a good friend, having an ally, having someone by her side that also knows and understands her diagnosis and how to best support her in school and learning from her as well so that we've got that sort of partnership. And I think, you know, in a mainstream school, we have to get over this hurdle of we are in a, a, a pandemic of poorly trained staff. And when staff are needing training, then what happens is a consortium school provides someone who perhaps has worked with someone who perhaps has a child who is perhaps autistic. So for me, the quality of training has got to be addressed. You know, we should be training all school staff. There's not an exception. Every member of every school should be trained in understanding, supporting, working with autistic students or neurodiverse and neurodiverse students. 
and those trainers should be quality experienced people and I think that is the only way that we will facilitate and support properly our autistic students in school whether they are females or males and I think um, other than that it's best friends and as much information that we can share and as much partnership that we can um, share with schools as well. Sorry I feel I got on my soapbox a bit then I do apologise. <laughs> No, thanks, Anne-Marie. That, that's great. OK, so um, I've got a final question here for you, OK? Um, yep. my, do my daughter is seven years old and diagnosed with mild ASD. She has an EHCP plan in her school, but she is very much behind on the school curriculum. My question is, do the school have, have a different or should they have a different course and curriculum for children with ASD? Well, schools should be differentiating for every child and within that differentiation, they should be taking into account your daughter's diagnosis and the fact that her learning and her um, understanding will be at a different pace to the other children. I think um, it's fundamentally wrong of um, schools when we are not seeing that differentiation. I know lots of parents who have that same sort of experience and you know inappropriate homework gets sent home and it's masked. You know we talk about masking, my goodness me, how much masking goes on in those circumstances when we mask that as inclusion, we mask that as treating our children the same. We don't need to treat everyone the same. Everyone isn't the same. And inclusion is not about, um, you know, a whole a exact same goings on for everybody. You know, inclusion is about including each individual and embracing and accepting them. And school absolutely have a responsibility in differentiating appropriately for all of the children um, in their class and especially your daughter. Thanks Anne-Marie, that, that was brilliant. What, what a webinar. Um, 